Hey, it's Mind Rolling. Ragu's here. I'm back. And I'm back because I just came back from India. So it's a real back, not just days ago. Well, a week ago. And had uh, another uh, quite wonderful experience. I actually went to a place called Chitrakut in India, which is where... If those of you know about the Ramayana and the story of Ram and uh, how his wife got abducted by the demon and he enlisted the monkey king, oh, the monkey king, the monkey Hanuman, who helped to find his wife and lead Ram back to defeat the demon army. That all took place in this place called Chitrakut, which is just like it was probably, well, I don't want to get too dramatic, but certainly it's, bet it's like it was in the 16th century or something. Uh, a, a fantastic place uh, and was able to actually help a company. Um, many of you know K.K. Shah. He had never been there and he's like our resident Ramayana expert and it, it was like a lifelong dream. So we had a, Quite a fantastic time, and we're doing a movie with KK for Love, Serve, Remember Foundation, and uh, we'll have a lot of the footage we took in that place that uh, will be available, so look for that in the deep future. Um, and by the way, uh, part of this whole thing uh, that took place there was uh, my beautiful wife, Saraswati's Yatra that she takes people following in Ram Dass's footsteps into the Himalayas. And boy, everyone is getting uh, a, such connectivity with the land of the gods, which is where, the, uh, where Maharaji was in, uh, back in the day when Ram Dass and I and Krishnadas and others went over there to meet him. And now people are meeting him over there, so to speak, and, uh, and having a... Uh, a, an extraordinary experience, everybody. We've done a couple of them now, and um, it's uh, it's quite a journey. If you are interested to follow in Ram Dass's footsteps to the places where we hung out with Neem Karoli Baba, with Maharaji, at a beautiful ashram in the deep valley of the Himalayas, in a place called Ramgar, please go to nourishinglife.com slash yatra and so coming up next spring march 6th through 17th it will be happening again and this is a great opportunity for those of you who wanted even just to go to india never mind follow in ramdas's footsteps and be in those places uh this last time was incredible they uh, people in went to kenchi and saraswati arranged uh through her uh, graces and the grace of uh, the manager and other people at the ashram to have a little tour through Maharaji's rooms in the back and, and Siddhiman. It was wow. So uh, it, it's pretty um, graceful, the whole tour, uh, Yatra. So uh, go to uh, nourishinglife.com slash Yatra. And what else do I want to talk about? I want to talk about the Ramdas store. Okay, there's a there's such great articles of uh, clothing and books and and malas and uh, be here now clock and on and on and on. Perfect for the upcoming giving season. And you know what? I've got a couple of new mind rolling T-shirts in that store that you can pick up uh, that should be up there within the next week or so. And, uh, you know, just go in there and have fun because, uh, you know what? It helps to support Love, Serve, Remember Foundation under which is ramdas.org, all the retreats, the books, the movies, the online courses, and Be Here Now Network, which we are a part of. So, now, to this really fantastic, Fantastic chat I just had with Nadia Boltz Weber, who is has been a pastor at a, at a Lutheran church, which the Lutherans just rely on the gospel word of Christ, 
And I went and told her about how uh, when I met Maharaji and I tried to, you know, said, okay, can, Maharaji, how do I meditate? And meditate like Christ. When he was nailed to the cross, he felt no pain, only love. He was lost in love with every sentient being. And he kept saying, that, and we went back the next day and he kept on about this, you don't understand, you don't understand. And that was for sure. But uh, I told that story to Nadia and she was like, wow, you went to India? Hindu guru? And you ended up, he talked, all he talked about was Christ. It was really nuts. Uh, so she is, uh, you could say, quite irreverent um, and uh, very unusual. And her take is, uh, is absolutely refreshing of anyone I ever heard in that tradition now. So uh, she says, the jagged edges of our humanity actually are what connect us to God and one another. And she talks, and she's so very honest about her own jagged uh, uh, edges. And um, and she and I got uh, right into a... uh, a, a, a very unified space about all of this and some great stories too uh, it was just a blast to be with her so here it is uh nadia bowles weber who's got who's a best-selling uh, new york times author by the way and I'll, I'll talk about her book accidental saints in the in the podcast uh and uh we will see you next time around on mind rolling hi this is mind rolling i'm back ragu and I'm with Nadia Bowles Weber. Nadia, welcome to the uh, podcast. Thanks. Happy to be with you. So, I guess we're going to need Nadia um, has led a ministry uh, that is of the Lutheran um, Church, correct? Yes. Yes. And uh, in in Denver, and uh, rather unusual in some ways in terms of anybody thinking about a straight ahead kind of a church in one way, and in other ways, very deeply uh, traditional uh, behind everything. I found that. Uh, oh, okay. I have to tell you a little bit about me because okay. we're going to have this conversation, and it. Um, certainly uh is is really formed for nadia by the presence of jesus christ and uh so i'm going to tell you nadia just a little bit and so many of my listeners know this a little some of this story but um so i'm jewish i grew up in montreal Mm -hmm. and i went to india followed ramdas who was looking to get back to the um, this uh, very incredible being named Karoli Baba up in the Himalayas. And so I went with him there, and I expected, oh, I'm going to meet an Indian guru, a Hindu. And I was, but I wasn't at all ready for what happened, which was, he said, one of the first things he said to me, where's your cross? I'm thinking like... <laughs> Jesus, I'm Jewish. I mean, I don't wear a cross. <laughs> and uh, and he said, no, you should wear a cross. I'm like, okay. And then the next thing, a few weeks later, I decided to, you know, you get a guru. It's typical. You ask for a mantra or something, right? Yeah. But I wanted to know how to meditate. So I said, how, do you, how, how should I meditate? And he said, meditate like Christ. When he was on the cross, he was not in pain. He was lost in love with every sentient being. Mm-hmm. And then the next day, Ramdas came and we asked Ramdas to say, "Well, how did he meditate? You know, to give us some kind of <laughs> reference." And he went inside and he closed his eyes, and we were like, tears came to his eye uh, on his cheeks, and we were like little kids. Oh. God, what's going on? What is this about? And he just kept repeating, oh, this is through translator, over and over, you don't understand. You, he kept saying that over and you don't understand. He was 
absolutely lost in love with every sentient being. He never died. He never, he kept saying that over and over. He never died. Anyhow, in that moment was my first experience of what Christ really is. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I had not even read the New Testament yeah. by that point. Oh, wow. Because I was brought up in a really screwed up uh, Jewish parochial education system. My yeah. teacher was like had just come from the camps, you know, had a number on his arm. You know, he was uh, and angry at everything, including Jesus, for whatever reason. I had no idea. But so this was my introduction. And that went on that he would compare Christ to the greatest of the Hindu uh, incarnations, Ram, Hanuman. And uh, yeah, that's what Hindus have going for them, man. They, yeah. uh, they, they could just incorporate whatever, you know, they're like, oh, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Awesome. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it is awesome that way. Yeah. So that yeah. just gives you some background. So I have some connectivity when I read yeah. this book, uh, by the way, Nadia wrote this incredible book, Accidental Saints, Finding God in All the Wrong People. And uh, so it's, you got to give us a little bit about your background, Nadia, and how, what happened to you that actually brought Although you grew up in a Christian family, what brought you back after getting lost a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I was raised in really kind of fundamentalist Christianity, actually. And um, it, uh, you know, I left that church when I was 16. I just couldn't have anything to do with it. I mean, there was such a difference between what they were teaching and what I was experiencing in the world. And uh I thought I would go with actual reality rather than <laughs> some <laughs> crazy thing, you know? So um, uh, also, you know, women weren't allowed to even pray out loud in front of men. I mean, it was like, it was so patriarchal. So I didn't even hear a woman pray in public till I was in my mid twenties. So um, anyway, I, I left that church and I, I had a pretty, serious uh, drug and alcohol problem. And so my, my story has a lot to do with um, sort of getting saved through getting sober and working the 12 steps of Alcoholics mm -hmm. Anonymous. So, uh, you know, you have to sort of, you have to find a higher power you can do business with, you know, if you're, if you're going to get sober in that program. <laughs> and so uh, I never stopped believing in God for some reason. Uh, I did go hang out with his aunt for a while, though. I, I was sort of involved his with his aunt. Well, yeah, I mean, like I was, uh, I, I spent a decade outside of Christianity and I was really involved in women's spirituality and Wicca and stuff like that. Mm, so mm -hmm, I never mm -hmm. saw it as like a replacement for God. It's, it, it just felt like I was kind of hanging out with his aunt for a yeah. while. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, but. Uh, but I'm grateful. I mean, I had to bask in the fe the female image of God for a long time to heal something within me before I could ever go back to Christianity. So, um, and when I came back, it was through a very different theological structure. I mean, Lutheran theology is really different than other systematic theologies because the center point is grace. The center point isn't being good, making yourself good, achieving righteousness, discipleship, all the all the striving, striving, striving that's at the center of so many other spiritual systems. Lutherans are like overrated. <laughs> like, what about the fact that um, everything's a gift, man? You know, like you can't you can't earn the grace it took to like take your first breath, you know? and to be on this planet and to love other people. And so, I mean, grace is the center point of that system. And um, I was really drawn to that. Mm. So, but then, but, you know, church culture itself, uh, I don't feel so comfortable in, you know, I don't, uh, there aren't a lot of churches in this country. I feel comfortable being in, you know, I have to culturally commute from who I am to who the church is and uh just feels like that's asking a lot, you know? Uh, and I felt like my friends probably felt the same. And so I kind of had to church, start a church from scratch that I'd feel comfortable in and my friends would too. And, uh, but yeah, it is, there's, there are these really deeply rooted traditions that are still really present in that community. So it's traditional, but it's just not conventional. If mm. that makes sense. Like yeah. my dad said it, 
it feels like high church at the Star Wars cantina. That's, <laughs> that's, that's you got a sense kind, of humor. It's yeah. kind of like that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's so great. Um, well, in in the I'm talking about this. I mean, there was a little thing I I noticed in the book that I loved. Uh, I'll just read a little bit. Uh, I simply continue to be a person on whom God is at work. And I don't even seek that out, to be honest. I admire those who take on, quote-unquote, spiritual practices, who seek a sense of well-being through yoga or meditation or quiet times. But other than lifting really heavy weights every morning at my CrossFit gym, I honestly can't think of what practices I do that help me become more spiritual. I can, however, talk endlessly about the way I've... I've been thrown on my ass over and over by the Bible, the practices of the church, and the people of God. That is to say, by religion. But Okay, know. the interesting thing is, I haven't done CrossFit for years, but I do oh, yoga yeah. every day, and I meditate <laughs> now. So <laughs> I love that. But... Um, but when when I read this, I go, yeah, you're absolutely right. Every, anyone yeah. thinking they're doing anything that's going to do anything uh, on that level, you know, yeah. through your mind, yeah. it's just not going to happen. And yeah. uh, on the other hand, one of uh, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong in terms of my own thoughts. Um, the practices, whatever they may be, from chanting, yeah. singing, meditating, yoga, whatever, sure. anything. Right. Uh, they do seem to, and I have found this in my, you know, it's been decades of doing this, yeah. this chatter is a whole lot different. I don't mm -hmm. believe in the chatter the way I used to believe in the chatter, the, my story, my chatter, you know, that's yeah. self-talking and all of that. There yeah. seems to be some efficacy to to helping that uh, that get along. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm in a very different place in life than I was five years ago when I wrote that. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, for sure. Very like? much. But, oh, my life's very different. I'm divorced, and I, uh, I'm in a, I've been in a relationship for over two years, and um, my kids are in college. I'm not in the church anymore. You know, I handed uh, it off. I know that. I, of course, I read that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what happened there? That would be nice to hear it about. Was a, it was a... It was a responsibility I took seriously, knowing when to leave, mm. because uh, I loved that I loved that church way too much to burden it with founder syndrome, and to have it be sort of beholden to my own ego needs or identity or something. And so, when it felt like they could, they would do just fine without me. Like I left while they still loved me, <laughs> but they didn't need me anymore. You know, and so I think as the sort of founder of something, um, it's important to know when to when that moment is. And I, I really just tried to pay attention. And and uh, if somebody had asked me two months before I left, hey, do you think you'll leave the church soon? I'd be like, no, I don't probably not. It was just it just happened. I just listened. And there were some things that happened. And I thought, oh, I think that's it. That's this is what I have to listen to. It's the time. And the fact that I was able to have a love and gratitude filled leave taking, um, I, I'll always cherish that. You know, I was able to leave, was able to leave well, which I'm, I'm mm. really glad, glad about. Yeah. Do you go back at all? I'm not allowed to. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a, it's part of the Lutheran tradition. Like when you don't, if you're not holding that office anymore, you have to leave enough space for the next person to hold that office, you know? Mm. So uh, maybe in a year or so, I might pop in every once in a while if it's cool, but uh, they need to be them without me for a while. Right. And you talk about identity. Uh, this is another thing that, you know, we, I like to talk about on this podcast a lot mm -hmm. is the way, you know, I just talked about the chatter and, and that, maybe doing some practices does give you a little space around that chatter that goes around that you believe in. And, uh, and of course the identity, all the different identities we have in terms of uh, mother, father, child, brother, mm -hmm. sister, work, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Yeah. How does, how does that, um, get addressed in terms of, uh, the, um, 
some of the what you have gotten from the actual word of of uh, Christ? Well, I think I love that Jesus used the word friends a lot. Hmm. And like I've called you friend and um, there's this relational quality to that that sort of spiritual connection to Christ that I think is is really beautiful. Um, to be to be God's friend is um, is a beautiful thing. It like I'm not God. It's I'm totally fine with there being a power greater than me. That doesn't bother me. Actually, I find that super hopeful because if I'm all the power there is, I'm screwed. So, um, <laughs> but. Uh, I think that having that that identity and that we talk about a sort of baptismal identity and and you know I was raised in a tradition where you chose when you're going to be baptized and it was like you were choosing God like you were choosing to be on this team and I don't think of it like that anymore I think of baptism as being always God's action upon us and um and I think that's how I orient so many things, like the passage you read, you know, I feel like I am being acted upon so much more than I have the agency to create the change I need. Now, I can put myself in a posture where I can receive more readily. I think that's okay. But, um, but, the, but the sense of agency, I'm okay with some of that being divine and not being mine. And so that, that includes my identity. So ultimately, um, my identity comes in the fact that I am a bearer of God's image, like every other human being. In Genesis, it said that God breathed into dust to create us. So we are like dirt in the breath of God. And um, that's not ever something that can be earned. And it's also not something that could ever be stripped away. And so to, that's something in which we can rest fully. And, um, and the thing I return to spiritually over and over again. Mm. Mm. I love that. Beautifully said. So wait, so people to get more of an idea of your um, relationship with moving through this life that uh, we have been given and the, uh, and speaking of course along a spiritual path and you say my spirituality is is most active not in meditation but in the moments when and then you have this list okay i realize god may have got something beautiful done through me despite the fact that i am an asshole yes and, and when i am confronted by the mercy of the gospel so much that I cannot hate my enemies. Let's stop right there, okay? Because I want to get there. You know, yeah. I want especially in these times, I have, Ugh. so I cannot. So mm -hmm. what, what kind of inspiration does, I mean, we put it, Ram Dass, who I, I talked to you about before, when he, con he has kept on his altar, aside from Christ, aside from all the saints and the Hindu deities and everything, he has kept a picture of, of one of our, shall we say, maybe negative images of a political figure. You know, mm. Currently, he of course <laughs> has Mr. Trump on his, and I'm saying, I mean, you really think, what can happen here? And he says, I just... I want to get to the point where I can, this is, there's a soul there, okay? We are all souls, and I want to get to the point where I am relating with his soul, not with his crappy karma that mm -hmm. he's inflicting out there. That's like the most Jesus-y thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, that's the thing that's so annoying about Jesus. <laughs> it's the, is, um, he has no boundaries. Like, he doesn't seem to really care about what we care about <laughs> so like the idea that we're supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us 
sometimes I say the gospel is basically the worst good news I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't naturally lean in that direction, like at all. My first reaction to almost everything is fuck you. Like I, I almost never stay there, but I almost always start there always like I'm just wired like that like I'm not this like spiritual leader in that way you know but like the only way I'm a spiritual leader is in like telling story after story about the way that I didn't end up staying there that there was something there was something out there that pushed me towards something else something more generous more gracious that offered me the grace to offer grace, right? It, it, it just doesn't come from me and my personality, you know? It comes from being messed with by God over and over. Mm. So, mm. man, he has a picture of Trump on his altar. That's that's hardcore. Yeah. That's gangster, man. That's like... But he, he was, <laughs> the, the edict uh, that he and we were given, which he seems way better at follow, following through with, Love everyone, serve everyone, and remember God. That's yeah. that's the the only three things that this uh, being in the blanket said to to us uh, for all practical purposes in terms of what practice. Yeah, how do I meditate? Yeah. Meditate like Christ. Jeez. You know, so it was at the it was coming that's from rough. the one. Yeah, that's I know rough, it's man. really. I mean, it's just I. What, how what's your ego supposed to do with that shit? That's hard, man. <laughs> well. I guess there's a way in which we we have a mandate and, you know, um, there's not much difference between the mandate that you work with through uh, the gospel mm. and the mandate that, that me I am personally working through, love, serve, remember. I mean, For not sure. to mention, of course, that's all he talked about was Christ. And I went there, I wanted Hindu stuff. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious uh, okay another uh, uh the moments when spirituality is most active when i am unable to judge the sin of someone else which let's be honest i love to do i don't know everything you say is in me <laughs> I'm, I'm right on your wavelength because yeah. my own crap is too much in the way yeah. i mean right yeah man i know it's hard I'll tell you, I had a conversation on stage a few weeks ago with Lance Armstrong. Oh, really? So, yeah, I was at the Nantucket Project, and Lance and I are on stage to have a conversation. It was so funny because that day, like, all these people were like, hey, man, don't let them off easy. You know, go get them. <laughs> and I'm like, first of all, Lance Armstrong has never done shit to me personally. I don't know what you think. Like, I'm a pastor, not a investigative journalist right <laughs> like i don't know what these people wanted from me yeah. they wanted me to really attack him you know and i uh i we got on stage and the first thing i said was i said lance i see in my notes that you took some drugs you weren't supposed to and you lied about it and then i was like oh my god i did that shit so many times right. <laughs> And then I said to the audience, raise your hand if you ever took drugs you weren't supposed to and lied about it. You know you did that shit. I was like, okay, now we can move on. Mm. So I was, um, I, I think that one of the reasons we love to judge the sins of other people is because if they're a little worse than ours, uh, we feel some relief from that. See, yeah. right. <laughs> it's classic, yeah. right? <laughs> like well, that's why. Oh. We love Trump supporters. Honestly, we love that shit. You know why? Because like, I never have to look at my own xenophobia. Not really. I don't really have to look at that at all. You know why? Thank God people who are so obviously worse than me came along. Yeah, exactly. Right? Tell me, yeah. tell me we're not somehow grateful for this. We get to take all of our stuff that frankly feels icky <laughs> and then we get to put our icky shit onto them because they're worse. And then we get to kill him. That's what a scapegoat is, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's what the continuation of polarization is very Absolutely. much happening. Eh? Uh, when I have to bear witness to another human's be human being suffering, despite my desire to be left alone. 
<laughs> yeah. Tuffy. Awful. <laughs> and when I am forgiven by someone, even though I don't deserve it, and my yeah. forgiver does this because he too is trapped by the gospel, by the word. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And when traumatic things happen in the world and I have nowhere to place them or make sense of them, but what I do have is a group of people who gather with me every week, people who will mourn and pray with me over the devastation of something like the school shootings and, and in our current moment. Uh, That's the, right. Oh, yeah. What happened in, in Pittsburgh at that synagogue. Yeah. And yeah. when I end up changed by loving someone I'd never choose out of a catalog but whom God sends my way to teach me about God's love. And uh, that is the real bottom line. I mean, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like, that's my spirituality, basically. <sighs> hmm. I know. That's why I'm not like a really standard spiritual leader. You know, like my congregation was always like, man, we're so glad we have a preacher who's clearly just preaching to herself and letting us overhear it. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, know? you know, that's all I have to offer. <laughs> in in my in my mind, that's the only real preacher. Uh, yeah. and, and I'll give you an analogy that's way out in left field for you, but no, well, mm. maybe it won't. Be. Right. I don't know. I have a really good friend. And people on the podcast that listeners, they know who he is. His name is Krishna Das. He was with us in, in India with Ram Das. Okay. And he came out of it uh, as a quote unquote chant guy. So he's been chanting the, you know, Hindu okay. mantras, but in very musical and rhythmic and yeah. easy to like go into. And so then ensued this thing in yoga centers across America, people doing, it's called. Kirtan, which is chant. Kirtan, yeah, Kirtan. sure. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So he's the guy doing it. And yeah. what sets him apart from everyone else is that he's doing it for himself, no matter who's around. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. and so people, <laughs> they yes. gravitate towards that because there's a, an obvious uh, authentic, authenticity to it. And I don't yeah, think it's yeah. any different than like when I'm reading this book, I'm relating to you. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's us going through this together. Yeah. And that yeah, you can trust a thing like that. You know, I mean, I uh, there's a video that went a little viral this summer. I think like like 40, 50 million people watched it. It's like a three minute video of me talking about forgiving assholes. Oh, and, really? Um, <laughs> yeah. And um <laughs> I was in the Seattle airport and this guy's like, oh, you're that forgiveness pastor. Oh, and I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm that is shitty at forgiveness, but is desperate pastor. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry. All right, well, well, uh, wow, that's a lot of use. So forgiveness is a real subject for people. Okay, give me a little thing about what you did there with forgiveness. Let's talk about that. Well, it's just, it's, if we don't want to forgive, like, I think one of the reasons we don't like the idea of forgiving people who've hurt us is that it feels like a betrayal of the part of us that was hurt. Like, it seems like this sort of weak doormat kind of thing to do you know like you're like oh it's like you're saying oh it's okay this horrible thing you did to me oh it's okay like who wants to be that person of course you know but the thing is is like if we if we don't forgive we're chained to that harm we're chained to that person like and and it keeps it keeps entering us you know that harm keeps it can metastasize in our own hearts like mm. we're actually we're actually in danger of becoming like that person the longer we keep absorbing the harm so forgiveness isn't a way isn't saying what you did was okay forgiveness is saying what you did is so not okay 
I refuse to be chained to it anymore. So it's like getting a pair of bolt cutters hmm. and going, I will not absorb it anymore. Hmm. So it's about freedom. Right. Well, that's, that's a great take on that. Yeah. Um, there, there's a, uh, there's so many great stories, Nadja, in the book. I love it. I mean, I love stories, just mm -hmm. you know, and people and what they're going through and so on. Yeah. And um, so uh, it's a long story about uh, this man named Larry. Yeah. And suffice to say that you just felt that you had not served him properly. Yeah, uh, for sure. And it was quite a, a, a very tragic event. Mm -hmm. But you say, thinking back, and you say that maybe my sin toward... Oh, by the way, there's lots of words here with completely freak me out, okay? Uh, oh, sin, yeah. sin. And you actually go yeah. in later <laughs> and say, well, maybe we're talking about... Uh, uh, like demons, I think later in the way you talk about demons, I'll bring it up. But uh, yeah. and then you compare that. It can be that these demons are addiction. They're this. They're that, and the other that yeah. we deal with. Yeah. Darkness, basically. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. Well, Francis Spufford in his book Unapologetic, which is genius book, I read it once a year. He calls sin. He doesn't use the word. He goes, look, I know the word's loaded. We'll just not use it. So and so from now on, instead of using the word sin, I'm just going to use the phrase the human propensity to fuck things up. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to uh, raise their hand and be like, I don't have that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. All right, uh, maybe it's say, my sin towards Larry doesn't rank up there with embezzling tithes or stooping the choir director, but if someone comes to your church and you make up excuses to not serve them with grace and love, it's still despicable. And the fact that I, quote-unquote, learned from it all and haven't done that kind of thing since doesn't make up for it, because I'm sure if I had a minute, I could come up with other things I'd done in its stead, which mm -hmm. means I am in perpetual need of grace. Who can't relate to that? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe some Buddhists that I know, but <laughs> <laughs> I bet they're not fun to hang out with. Yeah. Though. Actually, the Buddhists yeah. I hang out with are all fun, <laughs> and they all yeah, believe yeah. in grace. Uh, yeah. Um. So, uh, the um. I the, you talk about this at different times and um just how God works sometimes. It's not through the things, you know, we're ready for that we'd expect or whatever. It's through the things we don't and and that come up just out of the blue and, and really give us, you know, em enormous uh, teachings. Um, uh, and you talk about that a little bit and maybe if you have a, a, a something that, a story that really is the unexpected that really turns you around in a moment well it's always the unexpected for me it's always the sort of what i call the neighbor of last resort <laughs> who's <Okay>. my teacher <laughs> mm -hmm. you know like uh well when pa there's a there was a massively popular book called the shack do you know this book no okay well it was uh really popular i mean one of the biggest bestsellers of its time about 10 years ago maybe more the shack oh maybe 20 the oh, shack yeah, yeah. um uh, and by paul young and it's uh it's not to my taste this book it, i i don't particularly like uh mixing sentimentality and religion <laughs> i like mixing <laughs> irony and religion that to me is the perfect most delicious mix right mm -hmm. but like uh sentimentality is just not something i'm drawn to and so it was a bit sentimental for me right and i have some snotty opinions about this book and so i'm on my first book tour for pastrix which is the memoir before accidental saints and i'd only been out of seminary four years i didn't know that all of this stuff was going to happen to me and i'm on this 
my first book tour and that's just packed audiences and people are like crying and laughing and we love you. And then, you know, selfie, 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 sign, 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 go to your hotel room, a driver comes, picks you up, you do the whole thing and in the next goddamn town, you know, and I wasn't prepared for this. And then it was like, a, anyway, the first day of the tour, this dude was clutching my book to him himself and he goes, I hope this book is as big as the shack. <laughs> I just look at, I just look at him like he had just insulted me, you know. So then all this stuff is swirling around. The book ends up on the New York Times bestseller. The Washington Post sends a reporter out on tour with me for three days. They do a three-page spread in the post and this you know, Pulitzer Prize winning photographers sent out to shoot. I mean, Oprah's people were called like, you know, I mean, it was just all this shit swirling around me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I, there is nowhere to go but disappointing people from this point. Like yeah. it was freaking me out because yeah. I'm like, I'm not that person. I don't know what to do. I, my, my ego is like shaking somewhere in the back of my head. Like, I don't know what is happening. And I start freaking out, you know, and then my publisher, flies me to New Orleans and it was the day the book hit the the bestseller list and it was for the like Southern Booksellers Association meeting and I have no one to call like because there's no one in my world to whom this had happened so I there, I don't know who to call mm. and I'm freaked out and uh, there were three uh, three or four maybe five of uh, Hachette's authors were at this event. We were at the play, the place where they were selling the books. And one of the authors was just really sweet to me, an older guy. He was just so gentle and caring. It was just sweet, you know, and which was nice. Anyway, we're all at dinner and, and uh, I lean over to him and we we're just getting to know each other, different authors. One was a mystery writer, you know, different kinds. And I go, so what do you write? And this guy was so kind to me earlier in the day. He goes, well, I wrote this little book called The Shack. Oh. <laughs> oh. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, I don't want to like you. Uh, and I do. <laughs> and so the next day, I just swallowed my pride. And I'm like, that dude has had a whole circus around him. I mean, his book was massive out of nowhere. And, and I was like, here God provided in my path the very person I needed, the very moment I needed him. And just the earlier, two weeks earlier, I was saying shitty things about his book. You know? <laughs> and uh, I, and I, I asked him, I said, I just... I just like swallowed my pride and said, can I talk to you for a minute the next day? And I explained everything that was going on. And he took my hands and he said the most beautiful prayer for me. And he goes, Nadia, I promise you, no matter what happens, even if it feels unfamiliar, there is enough grace just for this day. There's enough. I promise you, you wouldn't be put in this position if there wasn't enough grace to fulfill what is your mm -hmm. calling. And I was like, fuck me. What I needed was to be pastored by the dude who wrote the shack. Oh, the worst. <laughs> What's it about? It's about uh, a guy who had a real tragic, horrible, violent thing happen to a child, lost the child. Oh, and yeah. then he ends up sort of kind of losing it and meeting the three different persons of the Trinity as actually embodied people wow. like it's it's a cool idea it was just you know it's just not to my it's yeah, just right. not my thing. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter he's <laughs> great. he's a love he's the real thing yeah. he's he's a lovely man oh, so, so great. but like if i had to choose okay i'm all freaked out who could be a helpful person who could kind of <laughs> yeah. pastor me right i'm not gonna choose that guy you know right, right. perfect perfect yeah. and i think in the same ways that people who get triggered by various things in their life through how they've been raised in their family or mm -hmm. in their local community, things that have happened to them, uh, 
once they become at all receptive to just being open to grace or to consciousness, whatever yeah. you want to call yeah. it, they are going to meet up with people that are, that trigger is going to just get hammered over huh, and over until they stop reacting the way that they have reacted throughout their lives. Yeah. And I think that that's grace as well. Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Um, it talk about Jesus as the Grinch, though. That that was really, I was like, really? There's a previous reference, but you say something I talked about earlier means that Jesus is skulking around like the Grinch after having stolen other people's stuff. He, just what we're talking about. Heavy laden with a huge red sack of our resentments and resistances and a bunch of other junk we never manage to get rid of ourselves no matter how much we know we should maybe he's just going from one person to the next taking off with our useless trash and i do <laughs> believe what i just said is that same thing that that's exactly right yeah, yeah. that's right that's right yeah i mean i just i just believe in divine intervention like i just believe in ways that God seems to mess with us and leave us better off in, but doing it in ways we wouldn't choose. You know, I just, I guess I just see it over and I would stop writing about this stuff if it would stop happening to me. I, guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you have a, a given avocation here. So you probably stuff's going to keep happening. To you, <laughs> I know. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. <laughs> the thing I'm actually, I mean, now that I'm not in parish ministry anymore, mm. um, you know, I really just, I'm traveling around and increasingly being invited to be myself and say the stuff I say and be a pastoral presence in non-religious spaces. Mm. Um like I just got home last night from Wellspring, which was this huge wellness conference in Palm Springs. And, uh, you know, I was talking, I did panels and stuff there. And, you know, that's not a scene they usually have Christian pastors at, you know. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, you know, Nantucket Project, this is the third year I spoke there. And they were like, would you just like preach a sermon this time? And then... I just get, I went to the opening of this uh, thing called the Church of Rock and Roll, which was a pop-up deal at uh, the Life is Beautiful Festival in Vegas. And Jason Flom, this like sort of legendary music uh, executive, put it all on. And he's like, could I fly you down? Would you go for a blessing uh -huh. at the beginning of the opening of this Church of Rock and Roll thing? And I'm like, hell yeah. So it's just... It's crazy. I'm like the people's pastor, public theologian or something, you know, <laughs> like itinerant, uh, you know, theologian. And uh, and it's it's beautiful and like having so much fun. And the thing I realized is like so many people were raised in the church. Like if, it's a massive population in our culture people who were raised christian and now don't go to church and do other things or don't do anything right and yet i found that people haven't they haven't had the healing they need around the wounds that religion has inflicted on them you know i don't know that that i think a lot of people have unprocessed hurt and trauma around religious wounds and I, my experience is that one of the ways that healing happens is by going back and claiming what is yours still, meaning maybe it's the hymns you sang, or maybe you were raised Catholic and you can't have anything to do with it, but you secretly still love Mary, like going back in a sort of spiritual reclamation project um, can be really healing of the, of the of the harm that happened in the same space, if that makes sense. Mm. And so I think sometimes when people out in the world encounter my teaching or writings or lectures or what or videos, I, my sense is that some of that happens for them. They can 
they can reconcile a piece of, oh, you know what? Yeah, man, I do love the Sermon on the Mount. Like, that is really beautiful. Maybe I can have that be a, a teaching thing in my life, even though I'm never going to go back to the church. It sort of gives them permission to reclaim part of their primal symbol system that mm. formed them, you know? Yeah. Do you have parts of your Jewish upbringing that are precious to you that you feel like um, you will always, that will always be part of you? Good question. You know, it's funny because that being that I talked to you about who just talked about Christ, Deem Karoli Baba is his name, he never, ever mentioned Jews. And oh. everyone, Ramdas, me, all these people were Jewish. A lot of Jewish well, people. Jesus was Jewish. And that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. That coming from the undivided, which is where he seemed to come from, yeah. <laughs> that there it's there is no division for yeah. for him there wasn't christians and jews there was jesus sure. Sure. who is the who is the yeah. greatest quote unquote in this case saint or whatever you want to right. call it huh. uh from from that area and yeah. so i um i honestly can relate much more with yeah. jesus now even though i'm jewish I, the cultural stuff and the there are certain things. Uh, well, I'll tell you a, f a funny story. So one of our mentors uh, was this amazing. He was like a an ama the most amazing human being ever, uh, aside from this Neem Karoli Baba, which is something else I wouldn't even know how to characterize. Uh, but this man was a mentor to us. He helped us on a day to day with all this crazy bullshit that was going on in our heads and yeah. attachments and and you know, resistance yeah. and all of it. He was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I went to India with my mother once mm. and we were with him. This is sort of addresses your question. And we were with him up in the Himalaya somewhere and we're just sitting around at night. He says, you know, you don't abandon your religion just because you've come to India and you're doing all this stuff. Yeah. You don't. And he said, I'd, I'd like to hear something. Do you have a prayer that you could you could recite and, yeah. and a little of the backstory is this this man used to go into deep in the yogis called samadhi deep deep trances where he was not uh, the i he he was not conscious of his i i-ness he was yes. in that yeah. broader so he, I, we said yeah and we started singing this one uh, prayer it was called enkelohenu mm -hmm. there's nothing but god nothing yes. but god it's done, I think, around Passover. Or something. Yeah. Maybe it's high holidays. I don't even know. See, I'm not even good at knowing which prayer comes with which. Worst Anyhow. Jew I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyhow, we start singing, and he goes, gone. My mother looks at me and goes, what's wrong? With I mean, she'd never seen anybody go into this kind of a state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I go, oh, okay, well, he'll be all right in a few minutes. And in that moment, I realized there really is only one thing going on and how it's expressed, of course, many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. And I had lost my uh, connection to that. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, you say mm -hmm. people, especially with you, you know, you give them a way to find their way back into that yeah. place, which is yeah. authentic. Yeah. Yeah. And right. I, I was so discouraged and disgruntled that I was receptive to Eastern stuff. And so sure. popped off, yeah. you know, that was also, you know, yeah. it was going to be an obvious thing. And that happened to many people. Part of it was psychedelics because that, that sure. definitely gives you uh, an entree to, to Eastern thought. But uh, coming back, I have <laughs> many a time, uh, I have entered back in and stepped back out. But the most connective thing that's always with me is that experience when I asked, uh, this being how to meditate meditate like yeah. christ that yeah. is more indelible with me than anything else that's amazing yeah. i love that yeah. i just <clears throat> i love um i just love faith mm. like i i 
it, I find it very moving the way in which human beings are really wired for symbols and rituals and practices and marking the year in particular ways and singing together in prayer. I, I love that about us as humans, mm. but in all the forms and knowing how much harm comes from when those forms are taken over by the worst parts of us. I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't neglect the truth of that, but mm. I also just am really <clears throat> in love with human faith. And um, yeah, I told someone recently, I was like, I want to be the Anthony Bourdain of prayer. I want to like travel around the world <laughs> experiencing <laughs> faith and belief and prayer and meditation and weird religious festivals like all over the world to try to help cultivate in people hey could we shoot just beyond the horizon of tolerance you know mm. let's mm. let's aim for envy mm. how do we cultivate holy envy mm. <laughs> you know mm. and this beautiful thing that the fact that human beings have always figured out ways to speak of the divine and rituals to connect to the divine and songs to sing of the divine. God is beautiful. Amazing, really. Mm -hmm. When you put it in that context. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, there's something else that uh, really does interest me. And that's, uh, do you know Annie Lamott? Do you know who Annie is? I know who she is, but I don't know her. Yeah. No, no. She's she's a friend, and we've done podcasts. She's come out to these retreats we do in Maui. Got to mm -hmm. get you out to one of these things too. I'd love you'd it. You'd yeah. love it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she's talked about mercy, <clears throat> and that's another one of those hard mm -hmm. words. And but yeah. you've got a twist on it. Um, the action, the you say the adjective so often coupled coupled with mercy, is the word tender. Yeah. But God's mercy is not tender. It's a blunt instrument. Mercy doesn't wrap a warm, limp blanket around offenders. God's mercy is the kind that kills the thing that wronged it and resurrects something new in its place. This is an entirely fresh approach as far as I'm concerned. In our guilt and remorse, we may wish for nothing but the ability to rewrite our own past. What, But what's done cannot, will not be undone. I'm here to say that in the mercy of God, it can be redeemed. Absolutely. Yeah. I cling to the truth of God's ability to redeem us more than perhaps any other. I have to, I need to, I want to. Those yeah. are important additions. For when we say, Lord, have mercy, what possibly, what else could we possibly mean than this truth? Mm. Yeah, talk about mm. mercy and tender, how they kind of... I guess I just don't have... I mean, my experience of grace and of forgiveness and of mercy and even of love, they just aren't fluffy, you know? I mean, it's like, it, it's searing. It feels, it stings. Like it stings a little to be loved well, for instance, because mm. it reminds us of all the ways we haven't been loved well or the times when we haven't loved well. And um, I don't know, there's something, when I've been forgiven by somebody when I didn't deserve it, you know, uh, that really hurts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a pain to that, you know? It's not just throw up your hands in joy. There's a pain to it. And I think joy is part of it as well. You get there eventually with all of this. But I guess I just, I don't know how helpful it is to speak sentimentally about all of this stuff. And I feel like that's where people so often go in like spiritual conversations. I mean, like you couldn't write my shit on a coffee mug. You know, it's not inspirational in that way, you know, but uh, I mean, we might lean toward those coffee mug sentiments, but I, um, it's so much more complex to me, you know, it encompasses the good and the bad, the stuff that's hard to stomach and the stuff that makes us just um, 
dance with delight. Like it's all, it, it's both things. And I think we can't spiritually bypass the, the hard parts of this stuff, mm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is definitely, uh, it's something we talk about a lot on, on the podcast or in these retreats we do. Uh, yeah. Get, yeah. Being real. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I, the, I'm, uh, my next book comes out in January. It's about oh, really? sex. Yeah. It's called shameless, a sexual reformation, but, uh, I'm really in the midst of working on my next one, <laughs> which is about, uh, which is sort of going, I think there's, there's a lot of perennial wisdom in Christian thought that could be really transformative for people if it's just if all of the sort of incrustation of organized religion is peeled away from it and people who are never i believe all the crazy shit about jesus i don't know why i'm down with the whole story i had virgin birth the miracles uh raised from the dead third person of the trinity i believe all of it right but like, I really don't care if anyone else does. I'm so not invested in other people. That's not even interesting to me. It's that's just a personal thing. But like, I just think that there's some there's some perennial wisdom within Christian some Christian thought that could be liberating and freeing and nurturing and healing for people who are never going to intellectually assent to the same theological propositions I do. Mm. And, and maybe uh, don't feel comfortable in organized religion. I'm fine. Whatever. That's fine. That's their story. I don't mind it. But like, that doesn't mean some of this stuff isn't useful. Yeah. Look at that video. Why the hell would 50, 40, 50 million people view a three minute video about a Lutheran pastor talking about forgiveness, right? That's not, that's wild. What I, was, what I was saying wasn't even original. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just a Jesus wild. message, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I think that a lot of that wisdom can be really useful for people. So I'm trying to figure out how to articulate that in, in a pastoral way, in a super truth bearing way um, that's hearable to folks because the message itself is good. It's just the way it's, the, it's the delivery system is a problem. Yeah. But there's other problems like, uh, they aren't doing what you're doing. For instance, and this is kind of where we're running out of time, but I just had to, I have to include these new beatitudes. Is that the way yeah. to pronounce that word? Beatitudes. Beatitudes. Yeah. And this, you said to the uh, congregation, I just picked out some that this is really what people need to hear. Blessed are they who doubt. You know what people are scared, who are on, on the path, whatever you want to call it, that doubt and that freaks them out? Those who aren't sure, who can still be surprised, right? Everyone is so cocksure of their particular uh, ray of the cosmic light. Right. Blessed are, are they who are spiritually impoverished and therefore not so certain about everything that they no longer take in new information. Okay? When, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, yeah. I just think that those are the things he meant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Best, blessed are the preschoolers who cut in line at communion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're the best. <laughs> All the way to blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Uh, yeah. I can't tell you how much Ram Dass, you you've gotten here when do you know 10 words or whatever it is who has spent hours and hours getting people to realize that fact. Yeah. Hours and talks yeah. from the... I think I have a line in there that says, blessed are those who've loved enough to know what loss feels like. Mm. Yeah. 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 Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are the motherless, the alone, the ones from whom so much has been taken. Blessed are those who, quote unquote, still aren't over it yet. Yeah. Right. Hey, I could go on. 
<laughs> I could go on and on. This is a great accidental saints, everybody, finding God in all the wrong people. Or as Bruce Springsteen said, it's hard to be a saint in this city. <laughs> yeah, <so it's, laughs> Correct. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, everybody, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have uh, links to Nadia's uh, website and maybe a couple of vid- she has a fantastic video because you, you're talking about this next book. It's a video that I saw: sex, shame, and scripture. Okay, that's very helpful, everybody, because that's, yeah. And so this book, can we co- get back together when you bring this book out and we'll help yeah, tell sure. everybody around? Yeah, for sure, yeah. And, and links to your books will be up there and uh, just go to Be Here Now Network. That's what this is, uh, the network now, just called Be Here. That's Ram Dass's famous book, Be Here yeah, yeah. Now. Remember? Yeah. So it's a Be Here Now Network. This is Mind Rolling, and I'm Raghu, and I so appreciate meeting you. Yeah, it was I fun mean, to meet you, too, Jesus. even though you were the worst Jew I've ever met. I know. Jesus, God, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to ask for <laughs> communion on that one. Uh, so we shall do this again. Yeah, for sure. See Sounds you all fun. next week on Mind Rolling.